Hi, I'm Corey Ruth, KD3CR. Thank you for attending my session on the All Bands and an HOA Stealthy Backyard Broadband Delta Loop Antenna. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to thank Eric Guth for Z1UG and his team of volunteers for all the hard work they've put on behind the scenes to make this expo a success. I'd also like to thank you for taking a bit of time out of your day to come listen to my session. And without further ado, let's get started. For the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who I am, give you some background on this antenna and uh, how I came to build one. Then we'll dig into the antenna itself. Take a look at what it is, how you can build one, and how it performs. Who I am? Well, I was first licensed in October 2016 as KG5 PXQ, upgraded to General three months later, and finally to Amateur Extra in March 2020. I've been president of the Queen Anne's Amateur Radio Club in Centerville, Maryland for a couple of years now, as well as a member of the Potomac Valley Radio Club, a contesting club for about a year. And uh, finally, I'm also member at large of the Los Alamos Amateur Radio Club in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which was the first club that I joined when I first became licensed. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the wonderful folks as part of the, those clubs as well. It's important as well to note what you don't see here, which is uh, any engineering experience, decades of experience as a ham. I don't have any of that. Um, as you see, I've been licensed for about six years so I've just got the experience that I've had with these antennas, building them, trying to eke out a bit more performance from uh, an HOA, you know, with, with limited space and uh, trying to abide by all those rules. So if it worked for me, it could well work for you. And that's what I'm bringing to the table with this talk. Now this... QTH situation is likely to be familiar to many of you uh, if you're attending this session. Uh, my particular situation, I have a townhome, an end unit in an HOA. As you can see, that property is not very large. It's 100 feet deep by 37 and a half feet wide. And being a townhome, I can't access all four sides of the property. There is an HOA, which brings additional restrictions. Uh, in this case, they don't allow external antennas aside from uh, for broadcast terrestrial TV or satellite dishes. Um, there's also very limited trees in, on the property. I have two that are on my property itself, fairly close together and not very tall. There are woods behind the house, but uh, that's off the property line, and uh, I don't have direct access to them. So in building an antenna or getting on HF, initially I was really struggling. There weren't seemingly a lot of options. I tried putting up an end fed, uh, just stretched across my uh, attic, you know, one, one direction. Didn't get a lot of success with that. I tried... Uh, putting up a portable antenna with coils, uh, you know, specifically the buddy pole. Didn't get a lot of success with that either. Did a little better with a longer end-fed half-wave antenna, but in order to do that, I had to string it really from one corner of the property to another, um, utilizing one of my neighbor's trees, and uh, it was clear that was only going to be a temporary solution. So I did that for a couple of field days, but it's not something you know, that I'm going to have uh, that I'd be able to put up at, at any time, you know, just to operate for a weekend or, or something like that. So I was looking for something else. And in doing that, I came across uh, hflink.com, which was the website for Bonnie Crystal KQ6XA and uh, a number of different variations on the broadband butterfly terminated dipole, which she invented as sort of an evolution of the terminated folded dipole, also known as the T2FD. Um, the version that really attracted me is this attic version. So um, I was able to put it up in my attic, 
get on the air, making contacts, um, which was something I really hadn't been able to do before on a, on a more permanent basis. And then uh, this antenna, like her others, uh, are traveling wave antennas. And what that means is the RF current travels in one direction only, unlike a dipole or other similar antennas that are resonant. And, uh, you know, the signal resonates back and forth. With the traveling wave antenna, the reflected waves are largely absorbed by the terminating resistor, which you see um, opposite the ballon there in this attic version of it. It's a 1000 ohm resistor and at the feed point uses a 16 to 1 high Z ballon. Uh, I will note that as of the time of this filming, uh, the hflink.com website does appear to be down. I don't know if this is permanent. I don't know if it's going to come back up, what the situation is there. But for the moment, uh, you're not able to access it. So I do hope that it comes back online. Um, but if you can't access it right now or in the meantime, you can pull it up by utilizing the Wayback Machine, uh, which uh, you don't need a DeLorean for it. Uh, this is the good folks over at archive.org. They have um, this software basically called the Wayback Machine. Uh, you can search for it in Google or link, get to it by going to archive.org. And it um, holds you know, snapshots in time of websites uh, all over the internet. So you can go there, um, put this website into the Wayback Machine, and pull up uh, an earlier snapshot of it and be able to see all of her great information on there, including the designs that I use to build both this attic version and uh, the one that I'll be talking about today. So using this attic antenna, just for kind of a reference, this has been over the course of the last year, I've been able to make over 500 QSOs across four continents, got worked all states, uh, 46 and counting DXCC entities confirmed, plus more that have been unconfirmed. And all of this, as I said, is about a year of operating somewhat sporadically from a suburban Maryland attic using 100 watts or less power. Not bad. So then you think, all right, well, hey, you're on the air, you're making HF contacts, getting some DX, life is good. But as any ham will say, you're always thinking about, can you eke out just a bit more performance? Can it be better? Is there something else you can do to make even more contacts, uh, you know, do even better in contests? And that brought me to another of Bonnie Crystal's designs. This one utilizes uh, similar concepts. You've still got the 16 to 1 balling. You've still got the terminating resistor. But instead of setting it up in the attic, this lets you set it up in a uh, backyard. So it's outdoors, but it's still very stealthy, especially if you do it uh, as I did here, using a push-up mast that you can extend when you want to get on the air, retract it to, in my case, below the fence line when you're not using it, and makes it all but hidden to your neighbors, HOA inspectors, anything like that. It's also very flexible. So you don't have to use a push-up mast or you don't have to use the same one that I did. You can use a fixed mast, a tower, um, connector on the side of your house, anything you like. Um, you can really make this your own. Within that flexibility, you can also have a potentially higher maximum height than using an attic version of the antenna. Um, if you've got trees, if you don't have trees, doesn't really matter. Again, you can use a, a mast of, of your uh, choosing, make it your own. Because you're using your backyard instead of the limited space of an attic, you're able to put up a lot more wire. And as you know, with uh, HF antennas, typically the more wire you get in the air and the higher you get it, the better. So in my case, I was able to use 300 feet of wire versus the attic version, I was only able to put up 125. So more than double the wire, that's uh, that's pretty nice. 
as with the attic version, it's inexpensive. You know, you're talking about maximum a few hundred dollars in uh, uh, materials, and you can certainly get it less than that, depending on what you have lying around and if you want to make some of your own parts versus buying them. It's easy to set up and take down. Uh, the initial setup, running the wire around the fence line, that type of thing probably would take you uh, a little bit longer, maybe uh, an hour or two, depending on um, how quick you are with that. But once you have it set up, it's just a matter of literally running the pole up, running it down. You can have that set up in five minutes, thereabouts, um, five, ten minutes, very, very quick. Another advantage to this one, unlike the attic version, which is horizontally polarized only, this one, the wire that you're putting up the mast is, of course, vertical, which gives you then some vertical polarization in addition to the horizontal polarization that you get from the slower part of the wire and the wire that you have running along the uh, top and middle or bottom of the fence. That vertical polarization, of course, is nice for getting uh, additional low angle takeoff, which can be uh, highly desirable for DX. The height of your mast, uh, the height of that vertical component can um, be adjusted, of course, depending on the length of mast you use, which can start to get um, pretty ni uh, nice um, compatible lengths for different bands. Uh, in particular, I've used a 40 foot mast here. Um, I have the balance set up partway up from the ground. So I've got in the neighborhood of 35 feet straight up, um, which uh, is just a little bit longer than a quarter wave on 40 meters. And of course gets you uh, even more uh, wavelengths on the um, higher frequency bands from that. So I was figuring with building this, I would be able to get probably better DX performance on six meters through 40. And for the most part, that's what played out with the testing. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, in addition, as with the attic version, one of the big, really big perks of this antenna design, this antenna type, is extremely broadbanded uh, nature. So it's less than two to one SWR across the HF bands. Not needing a tuner can be really nice. Uh, that's an expense you don't have to pay. Um, that's uh, you know um, an additional flexibility for it. And if you're doing something like, excuse me, uh, like automatic link establishment, which is what uh, I think this was originally designed for, it's able to access all of those bands um, without uh, needing to tune up every time, every time it changes around. It's got the drawbacks, of course, of the attic version as well, which is that it has low gain. Um, it's not going to be as gainly as uh, something like a dipole even. It'll be a little bit, you know, one to two S units lower than a dipole on many bands as you start getting into uh, the low bands like 40 80 and especially 160 you'll have um, some negative gain on there but still going to be getting on the air and making contacts so before we move on from this here you'll notice that i've got the 1000 ohm resistor um, more or less on the opposite side as compared with the Balan. And when you notice back to the attic version, that was the same Balan on one side, resistor on the other. That's how this design works. You want to have roughly equal amounts, uh, equal lengths of wire on either side of the resistor. So for this one, I've got 300 feet of wire. I've got roughly 150 feet on either end. So when you're planning it out, regardless of exactly how much wire you, you're using, whether that's 200 feet, 250, 450, whatever the length it is, just make sure you're using um, that resistor as close to in the middle as you can. Within a few feet either side is fine, but uh, 
roughly equal lengths of wire on, on either end. And um, when you've got the bellend set up there at the base of the antenna, you can use just regular standard 15 ohm coax and run that into your shack. The materials that I used, again, totally flexible and customizable. You don't have to use the exact same stuff as I've used, but I've used um, 14 gauge antenna wire with a UV resistant braid from, uh, or UV resistant uh, outer part from DX Engineering. The 16 to one high Z Ballon is from Palomar Engineers. Uh, you're also going to need a 1000 ohm resistor rated for the amount of power that you want to put through the antenna. In my case, that's going to be maximum 100 watts. So you need a 100 watt or more resistor. Uh, it's recommended for this antenna design to use a non-inductive resistor. Um, ideally, that's what you would use, but those are uh, quite a bit more expensive. I've actually had success with using the standard uh, wire wound kind of cheap resistor uh, that's like this one here, or you see in the image on the bottom right. Difference in price, I got this two pack of these resistors for $8. They're $9 now, really not that much of an increase. Whereas the non-inductive ones, you can get those from Palomar Engineers and others for in the neighborhood of 90 to 100 dollars so i leave that choice up to you but i've had pretty good success using this much more uh, affordable one so you know your mileage can vary and i did use a 40 foot heavy duty fiberglass spider beam pole that was 129 dollars absolutely do not have to use this one you can use whatever you've got on hand. Uh, it could be a fixed mast, a fishing pole, um, something more flexible, an existing tower, a tree, side of your house. Totally up to you with that. And uh, this is just showing what I used. Now, if you're gonna make this a permanent or semi-permanent setup, I absolutely recommend also having a soldering iron and solder as well as heat shrink tubing to be able to um, more permanently affix the wire to the resistor and add some weatherproofing there. I'd also recommend some weatherproofing for the coax attachment to the ballon. Uh, the ballon itself is already weatherproof, so no issues there. And uh, of course, for safety, I would recommend um, all the grounding and bonding precautions that you would take with any outdoor antenna. So in terms of actually setting it up, uh, I started with uh, the mast. So you want to set that up in one corner of your yard. The exact corner doesn't matter. I had it set up closer to the house so that the coax run was a little bit shorter, but that part is up to you. Uh, from there, I ran the pole up and had the wire going along it. Just um, fixed every three to four feet or so with uh, these elastic ties. These ones in particular are bongo ties. You don't have to use those or don't have to use those exact ones. I just didn't want the um, wire to be kind of swinging in the wind as much. This keeps it in one place. Um, these bongo ties, you can pick up a whole bag of them for five or six dollars on Amazon or elsewhere. From there, run the rest of the wire along the other two sides of your the top of your fence and then down to I would say at least the middle you can have it lower you can even run it along the bottom of the fence the designer said that'll work too um, but I ran it as you can see here along the middle of the fence back around to the ballon this picture is also a good illustration of how stealthy this antenna is I have the black 14 gauge wire running along the top of the fence there um, in the corner down to the middle and back. And it's pretty hard to make out. If you weren't aware that it was there, if you weren't looking for it, you might not even see it there at all. And it's certainly not very, um, uh, very intrusive. 
So it's uh, great if you're looking for something stealthy. As mentioned before, you're wanna, gonna wanna have the resistor roughly in the middle between your two lengths of wire. So I put the entire wire up along uh, the fence and then cut it where I'd calculated as the rough middle. And from there, strip the two um, opposite lengths of wire. I just attached it here temporarily because I was only setting it up for a couple of days. But uh, of course, as I mentioned, if you're putting this up permanently or semi-permanently, here's where you're gonna wanna solder and weatherproof that. And uh, after you've done that, you're gonna wanna want attach the other ends of the wire to the ballon. And the designer mentioned it's important that the uh, length of wire that you put straight up your mast, that vertical part, you're going to want to attach that to the hot side of the ballon. And uh, you can kind of just see it there on the bottom. It's where you plug in your coax and uh, you're all set to just sit back and admire your work. This is the uh, 40 foot mast fully deployed. You can see with it being Fiberglass, it does have some flexibility there. Um, it's not perfectly straight up, but it's you know, fairly vertical. If you were using um, a tree or uh, a tower or a more rigid mast, uh, like an aluminum mast, something like that, um, obviously that would uh, be, be straight up, but it uh, definitely works either way. Again, just to illustrate the stealthiness of the antenna, uh, this is a photo on the left from my, the front of my house, a photo on the right from the side, and you cannot see it at all. Obviously, if you have a taller mast, something like that, you, you know, might see it above your roof line, or if you've got a single story house, but in my case, a you know, two story and a 40 foot mast, couldn't see it until you were standing pretty much in front of the gate over here, way at the back on the side of the house. You wouldn't even know it's there. All right, so once I got it set up, one of the first things I did was to check out the SWR. Um, this is using a rig expert antenna analyzer um, and as advertised, yeah, two to one or less uh, across all of the HF bands. And in fact, I found that in most of the bands, you know, 12 meters through 160, it was 1.5 to one or better. And this is with no tuner needed. Uh, of course, a lot of folks will say, hey, a, a dummy load is a great SWR2. That doesn't mean it performs well. But as you saw with the attic version, you know, even with this very low at, uh, quote unquote dummy load antenna, I was making contacts you know, four continents, 500 plus QSOs, 46 DXCC entities, all 50 states. So, you know, don't let the naysayers get you down. Um, in these uh, SWR graphs, I've got uh, top left here, there's uh, six meters, 10 meters, 12 meters, and 15 meters. You can see that with six and 10, there are some parts there where it's at up about two to one some parts that are lower uh, in the CW and digital parts of 10 meters, it's actually down about 1.2, 1.3 to one. And most of the other bands are gonna be just like what you're seeing here with 12 and 15, where it's under 1.5 to one for the entire length of the band. Here's a few other bands just so you can see them. Uh, 17 meters, 20 meters, 30 and 40 all 1.5 to one or less. And finally, 60 meters, which is a problematic band for a lot of antennas in trying to tune because it's not harmonically related to any other band, but not a problem with this one because it's uh, so broadbanded, it's less than 1.1 to one really across uh, that entire band. Uh, then you've got 80 meters, uh, 160 meters, and just for fun, I even plotted the SWR chart for two meters, and uh, surprisingly, it's quite usable. Um, 2.4 to 2.5 to one across uh, the entire band there too. So yeah, just in case you wanted to work two meters, you can do that. 
But of course, you're all going to be wondering how it performs on the air. I had a fairly limited amount of time to test it on the air uh, before putting this presentation together. So this is going to be um, a little bit more limited in scope than I would have liked, but gives you at least a sample of what you can potentially expect to see with it. Uh, unfortunately, on that day, 6, 10, and 160 meters uh, were not really cooperating, um, just uh, weren't open, the, the conditions weren't great. So um, this will show you a look at the other bands, though. Uh, 12 meters, I um, wasn't able to get any signals heard with the attic version, but on um, the backyard version, you can see a handful of signals across the eastern half of the US, a couple in Europe as well. Um, I'll note that these were all taken between about 10.15 and 10.45 in the morning on the day of the test. I ran through each of the bands once with the attic version of the antenna, uh, then took the ballon down, attached it to the backyard version, and ran it again. Only have the one ballon, so that was the way I had to run it. And these are all with just 40 watts of power running FT8 and showing the maps via PSK reporter. All right, on to 15 meters. You've got the attic version on the left, backyard version on the right, and you can see a distinct improvement. When you get the backyard version, uh, a lot more signals, a lot more folks uh, hearing me in the Eastern US. You've got one down in Brazil, and uh, significantly more in Europe as well. So it's it's clear that that's, that's getting out uh, quite a bit stronger. That repeats itself on 17 meters as well. Um, where, again, uh, a lot more, substantially more signals being heard in Europe um, instead of the attic version where it's really kind of limited to the eastern U.S. on the backyard one being heard all across the U.S., right up into western Canada, and uh, more signals down in the Caribbean as well. 20 and 30 meters were the exception. Uh, with these... I was actually seeing more signals being heard with the attic version, which was uh, a little bit curious. Uh, the attic version, 20 meters, being heard all across the U.S. and Canada. A um, handful of um, non-North American contacts. There's you know, the one there in the Caribbean, uh, one up in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, just a little bit less with the, the backyard version more, I would say, the eastern two-thirds of North America. Uh, one up in Alaska that wasn't heard with the attic, uh, but overall, more signals with the attic version. That's also what I experienced with the 30-meter band, where with the backyard version, I was really only seeing kind of eastern U.S. Uh, with the attic one, I were, was able to get some western U.S. and uh, one of the Caribbean islands being able to be heard as well. 40 meters during the day, I was getting more reception reports with the attic one, but that I think makes sense given that the strictly horizontal polarization and a little bit lower antenna height of the attic version lends itself a bit more to um, an NVIS, uh, Near Vertical Incident Skywave um, form of propagation that's so sending a lot more of the signal kind of straight up, which is giving you uh, a pretty good reception within a few hundred miles, which you're seeing here uh, from Maryland getting the eastern U.S., whereas uh, with the backyard one, getting some of that vertical polarization uh, really good for those other bands for DX during the day, but um, uh, during the day on 40, uh, that's uh, just going to be largely getting absorbed by the atmosphere. So I'm still getting some uh, more local contacts, but uh, not as much uh, a little bit further out. But that'll change at night. You'll see that in a moment. So here, um, I had left the antenna set up uh, with the ballon outside at night, wasn't able to take that apart and 
uh, put it back up into the attic for a direct apples to apples comparison at night. So this one is actually um, on the left, the attic one from a, an earlier day, just to kind of give you a, at least a, a little bit of a look of what that might be like. And you can see with the backyard version on the right, a lot, a lot of signals that are being heard. Um, a lot more in Europe, uh, some islands just off the coast of Africa being heard down into South America, the Caribbean, really not seeing a whole lot of that with the attic version. Uh, aside from a few stations in Europe and one super station down in South Africa that's hearing me, it's even at night, um, again, due to that uh, high angle of radiation, largely focused on the eastern half of the U.S., handful in the west, but mostly eastern U.S., whereas um, on the backyard one, uh, I think if I had waited another couple of hours to where um, the nighttime had moved across North America uh, over to the west coast, I'd see even more, but you can see up to where uh, the night line is there, very dense amount of stations that are hearing me, and even some on the uh, the daylight side all the way out to the west coast which i thought was quite impressive um, on 80 meters even with the vertical polarization um, the, the vertical length just isn't long enough that uh, i'm able to get uh, tremendous propagation on uh, 80 meters and as mentioned on 40 80 and increasingly down to 160, you're getting more uh, negative gain. So there's just uh, simply less uh, oomph behind the signal as it goes out. But despite that, you'll see, again, the earlier uh, attic situation, um, mostly East Coast, a little bit up into uh, Michigan and Illinois there, but relatively localized you know up to a few hundred miles that does get a bit farther with the backyard version um further to the west farther to the south even uh, down into the caribbean where i'm being heard so all right uh, conclusions that i can draw from this obviously i'd love to have more time to be able to do some testing with this, but based on the limited amount of testing I've done so far, I've seen enough to say that it's entirely plausible that this backyard version gives a little bit better performance than the attic one, uh, especially on uh, the um, uh, higher frequency bands, um, 12 meters through, um, through 17 meters, really good performance nice dx that i'm seeing there and on 40 and 80 seeing better performance than the attic as well it's probably still a little bit less performance than you would get from a full-size dipole but still very usable and it gives you more bands and you can make use of a smaller area as well if you've got the space to set up you know a big full-size dipole for 80 meters by all means go for that but if you don't um, this could be a, an antenna that might work for you. It's a legitimate option, I think, for people with a small yard and an HOA. And the bottom line is it gets you on the air, making contacts and having fun. And to me, that's what ham radio is all about. So thank you very much for listening. Again, I'm Corey Ruth, KD3CR. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so by dropping me an email at KD3CR at arrl.net. But for those of you who are listening live, the question and answer portion of this is going to begin right now. So I look forward to seeing you and answering your questions in just a moment. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, pre-recorded Corey, and welcome live, Corey. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, being here and moderating today. I, what, nope. Uh, wrong way. Do that that way. There we go. You're the important one that they need to see. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. I was um, I was absolutely fascinated to see the results that you were able to achieve with such an antenna. You're you're describing it. And I'm like, oh man, that's a compromise. All oh, that's going to co oh man, how is this going to work out? And then you show the results. I'm like, you know what? 
sit down, Mark, because you don't know what you're talking about. You you put it up and it worked. That's fantastic. So I w- yeah, I was super excited to see that. Uh, and we got some great questions in the Q and A section. So if you've got any questions for Corey, please type them up in uh, the Q and A or the chat room. And also, I saw something that I haven't seen in other presentations. Other people in the chat room responding. People in the chat room responding to other people in the chat room. I didn't realize that uh, people were able to see each other's questions. That didn't used to be the case. Like as early as this morning, that wasn't the case. So um, yeah, even a couple hours ago when I watched a presentation, I could only see my own questions and uh, and comments. So yeah, that's so, a feature they've enabled. Yeah, that that's great. I've, uh, so so sev- several of these questions may have already been answered in the Q and A, but for the recording, we'll go ahead and ask them here anyway. Um, but before we get to any questions, I do want to bring this one up. Uh, Bonnie, the the gal's work who you uh, based all of this on, is an amazing, amazing lady and a good friend, says Daniel VR2HF. Um, wanted to give that shout out to Bonnie. I don't know her at all, or I've, I've only just learned about her work from watching this video. But uh, that sounds sounds like somebody I should <laughs> I would like to nerd out with and chat with about antennas sometime. Yeah, she's done a lot of work. Um primarily uh, to further um, ALE, Automatic Link Establishment, which was kind of the basis of, of that website. Um, and a lot of her intended designs were kind of focused on, on that, but also works great for making you know regular contacts. Absolutely. Uh, another quick comment, shout out to archive.org. I agree. Love archive, uh, yeah. Wayback Machine, all of that fun stuff. All right, on to the questions. Thomas, <clears throat> excuse me, AC7A asks, is that 16 to 1 Balon, is that step up or step down? Yeah, so I was taking a look um, just as the presentation was running on Palomar Engineers um, product page for this, as well as on um, Bonnie Crystal's design f- format for, for it, because you don't have to use the commercial one, there's actually instructions on mm-hmm. the website that you can build your own with, um, you know, just some some wire and some uh, toroids. Um, and it didn't say whether it was step up or step down, but I know that it does convert from the 800 ohm resistance that you'll see on the uh, antenna system itself down to a 50 ohm or very close to it that your um, transceiver is going to uh, like and appreciate. Um, from, from what I understand, step up, step down refers to whether it steps up or down the voltage as it's passing along. And I couldn't find uh, an answer for that. So I, I do apologize. Uh, it it's, it refers to the impedance. So whether oh, it's okay. up or down depends on which direction you're viewing it through the uh, through okay. the thing. The, I think the answer is it's a 50 to 800 ohm mm-hmm. um, impedance transformer, not 50 to, what would that be, 6 ohm? You know, whatever right. 50 divided yeah. by 8 is. Um, so it's a 50 to 800 ohm. All right. Guy, KS6F, asks, what type of fence do you have? Is it wood or concrete? My fence is just regular wood, um, not tremendously thick wood. It's, I think, for the most part, uh, 2 by 6 along the top rail and um, a bit thinner, like a 1-inch thick wood for the the slats if you can call it that but yeah just uh, just regular wood obviously if your fence is metal this wouldn't work quite as well um but in a situation like that um the attic antenna version of it might work a little better yeah presuming your um shingles aren't metal because a lot of folks run into that or have a metallic vapor barrier um, if or all of those are metal, then yeah. <laughs> you might be in some trouble. But yeah, uh, the concrete fence likely has rebar in it, so you need to be careful with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Judy asks, uh, KK seven, <coughs> excuse me, HCH asks, can we get a copy of your presentation? Yeah, absolutely. If you go to the main website for the QSO today Ham Expo and click. Uh, so that's QSO today, hamexpo.com. Click on presentations. That has all of the uh, sessions listed there alphabetically. And if you scroll down to the fourth one on there, that's mine, all bands in an HOA. Um, so it's got listed there the presenters, and right below that, 
collateral or slides. So you can see this entire slide deck in a downloadable PDF format. And uh, um, that's, you know, free for, for anybody, uh, but all of you who are, who are here, you can also um, download that. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Wayne, VA3NCA asks, how much power does that terminating resistor need to be to be able to handle? And I think you addressed this in the presentation after he asked this question, but go ahead and refresh our memory. Yeah, I, I think you're right there. But yeah, it needs to be rated for the amount of power that you want to run through it. So in my case, I was doing um, or having it designed for 100 watts or less. Um, so I just have a 100 watt resistor. You can certainly get resistors that are capable of more than that. Uh, if you, especially if you don't have neighbors nearby and want to run an amplifier on there, just make sure your resistor is rated for the, you know, 500, 000, 1500 watts, whatever you want to run. Yeah. and uh, you'll be golden the 16 to 1 ballon that i used is rated for 500 watts but there is a version of it that will handle uh one and a half kilowatts as well yeah so the you actually going for the transmit power will definitely be safe you hope that it's not actually dissipating all of that because then none of it's getting right. radiated right so it's actually going to be something less than your transmitted power because whatever it's not dissipating is what's going out the antenna mm -hmm. um so hopefully it's actually less than the transmitted power but if you rate it for you know you got a 100 watt transmitter you stick a 100 watt resistor there you're gonna be fine hopefully yeah, it's absolutely. actually generating less heat than that though yeah hopefully yeah um uh, Wayne, same Wayne, asks a question. That 16 to 1 seems to be matched to the 1K ohm termination at the end. Is that right? Uh, the 16 to 1 ballon is just matching the 800 ohm resistance in the antenna itself. Uh, the uh, different variations of this antenna use anywhere between an 800 ohm and a 1200 ohm resistor, and anything in that range is going to be fine. For this particular design, the 1000 ohm just works a little bit better, providing a smoother SWR curve. Did you actually measure the distinction between an 800 ohm resistor and a 1000 ohm resistor and decide that the 1000 did better? Or was it just thousands are easier to come by than 800s because they don't make 800 as a common value? I was re relying on Bonnie's um, re research oh. on this, actually. <laughs> yeah, I uh, didn't independently verify that, but she has for um, I think it's about eight or ten different designs that are similar to this. Some of them she uses the 800 ohm, most of them the 1000, a handful that are the 1200. Just depending on the design, um, she figured out what worked best, and uh, I trusted her. So Gotcha. Okay. Let's go with that. Steven K3FZT asks, I use a 250 foot long terminated N fed inverted V, that's a mouthful, with a 9 to 1 unun and a 500 ohm resistor. You could get more vertical polarization by putting up another push up mast in the diagonally opposite corner and thereby having a portion as an inverted V. 73s. Yeah, that's certainly something that could be done. Um, I considered having more masts set up in, in various other corners um, and ultimately just went with the one because um, of the other corners, two of them, as you can see from the one photo uh, where the fence of the backyard kind of sticks out a little bit to the side. So two of those corners, if I had a mast, you'd be able to see it from the road where people you know, walk on or driving by, don't want to do a void. And uh, the fourth corner, which would have been an option, there are enough branches that hang kind of over that corner of my yard from uh, the woods in, in the back that uh, any masks that go up would actually kind of run into those run and into tree, uh, yeah. wanted to avoid that too. So I, I stuck with the one, but it was enough to get a decent amount of vertical polarization in addition to the horizontal from the, uh, the shorter uh, ports. Another one from, uh, uh, no, this is the first one. Walter, WA7SDY, asks, on the fence antenna, what would be the results if the push-up pole was left at fence level, making both wires parallel? I think meaning that if, if you just went around the fence without the vertical section. Yeah, so if I'm understanding this right, I, I think he's meaning 
having it with the ability to push it up, but just having it transmitting in the lower position, it seems like. Um, in that case, you would have a lot of the wire that would have been up in the air um, hanging down, so you would probably get some interactions going on with that that may not be desirable. If you designed it such that it just only went around uh, the fence line and ignored the mast part, it would still work. You would just lose the uh, advantages of having the height and uh, the vertical polarization as well and make it essentially just a uh, NVIS antenna at that point. So it would work great on say 40 meters out to about 300 miles around your location. Not really great at all beyond that and uh, some of the higher frequency bands you might not get out as well because um, not um, not many of those work for for nvis it's really a, a 40 and uh, to a lesser extent 80 meter um band for that so yeah. it would work just not not quite as well okay melvin k7mze asks i'm looking for a six meter antenna I live in an antenna-restricted HOA, but with no fences. I do have tall shrubs on one side of my house. Can this approach be used for my situation for a six-meter-only antenna? Yeah, I think if you're looking for something just for six meters, you'd probably be better serve with uh, just a regular full-size dipole or uh, or vertical or vertical dipole, because uh, half wave on six meters is only you know like ten feet, a little under ten feet. 15 so feet. if you about, can about three meters yeah if, so if you can manage <laughs> to find somewhere to fit that whether it's in your attic or um you know in the tall shrubs if those are tall enough yeah i think that would be that would be a better option than this um this one certainly would work on six meters and and does work on six meters but because of the length of it you do get some lobes happening in the um uh in the propagation which um generally is something you would want to avoid so if you're designing it just for six meters i would stick to something simpler yeah i i, I would tend to agree with that <clears throat> okay uh dino kl0s asks how did your rf safety evaluation come out with your townhome next door yeah so when i uh, did the performance the uh, rf safety evaluation on that using the calculator on the AWRL's website um, found that due to the relatively low power that I was putting through it and um, the, you know the distances like the um, controlled versus uncontrolled and that type of thing um, it was actually for the most part fine uh, especially on the lower frequency bands um, they would have to have been pretty much licking the pole in order to have any kind of issues there uh, on six meters, you would, wouldn't likely want to run 100 watts if they were in their backyard, that type of thing. Um, but if you're running lower power, you know, 40, 50 watts or less, then you'd be fine there. Because um, if I recall right, the uh, safe distance for that one, even in an uncontrolled environment, is in the neighborhood of a foot, foot and a half. Yeah. So you would be all right there. So it, I've got to ask a question about your HOA, though. Is that a common problem that you have with people licking your antennas? <laughs> Not so much, luckily. Okay. I've got pretty good neighbors. but Thankfully. Uh, Very good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jim, WB2ZOP asks, how is the noise floor compared to the attic version and past antennas? Also, how important is the symmetry between the ballon and the resistor for the wire runs? As in, how important is it that the wire runs be the similar length? Great presentation. Thank you presentation yeah thanks jim appreciate the question and uh then the kind comments there uh in in terms of the symmetry you ideally want to have it as close to symmetrical as possible so roughly equal lengths of wire on either side of the ballon and likewise on either side of the resistor it doesn't have to be perfect you know if it's within six feet of being equal uh, on on either side you should be good Beyond that, you would still have it, you know, it would still work, but you start to get some um, peaks and valleys in your SWR curve, so it won't be quite as flat across all of the bands. Um, and uh, the other part of that question, sorry. I... Uh, the uh, oh. Asking about noise floor. Noise floor, oh, right, thank you. 
Um, yeah, it's actually seemed to be a little bit quieter with the um, outdoor backyard version. Um, normally, you have a bit more noise with vertical polarization than horizontal, but I think by virtue of being outside, it was further away from our um, household wiring appliances and that type of thing, and I think that contributed to making it a bit quieter. Oh, yeah. I would say they were pretty similar, but um, just a very slight noticeable um, increase in um, you know in the quietness, so reduction in noise with the backyard version. Yeah, uh, just from my own experience, getting an antenna away from structures, mm -hmm. anything with an electric, like in a house, the farther yeah. you can get it away, either up or away horizontally from uh, from those structures, is R squared is your friend in this context because mm -hmm. the energy from those radiating devices is going to decrease with the square of the distance away from it. Um, and so the farther away you can get, the better, and, uh, which is unfortunate in a HOA-style environment or townhome-style environments where you don't have a lot of space to be able to get things farther away. Um, but, yeah, getting it outside of the attic is, mm -hmm. is and into your backyard is likely to make that better. Uh, da -da -ba -ba. All right, Stephen K3FZT says, Congratulations. This is a creative example of the traveling wave antenna concept, which, like you, I also enjoy, despite what others may say. Down with the haters. <laughs> Appreciate that, Stephen. Yeah, I, I think a lot of folks on you know first glance, first look, have a pretty similar reaction, thinking uh, like, oh, that's never going to work. It's just a, just a cloud warmer. It's a dummy load. And, you know, it, it's just it, a lot of people I don't think have come across it or, or used it before um i've had very good luck with it here um working uh contacts all over the world uh one of the folks in my ham club had an nfed antenna strung out uh, in his backyard but it was um, based at a fairly high point on a tower yeah. he's getting older he couldn't uh, climb to be able to service it you know when wind brought it down and such anymore so after hearing my presentation on the attic version last year, decided to build one of those in his attic. And he said he honestly couldn't see much performance difference between it and uh, and his NFED. And he's able to you know, go up in his attic. He doesn't have to climb a, a tower or a ladder or anything. So, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, it worked pretty well. It, it, what you described is absolutely not the ideal antenna right oh for, yeah, but it for doesn't sure. matter if it's the antenna you can put up mm -hmm. and it's good enough right i think i think one problem that we as ham radio operators fall into and i'm i'm as guilty of this as anyone is that we keep trying to improve things right and mm -hmm. like i want i want a better system what's the best way to do this what's the best antenna i can do for my money or what or whatever your constraint is and I think it's appropriate to remember those constraints, right? And be yeah. okay with what you get within those constraints. Because your compromise antenna where you're dumping a third of the power into a resistor rather than radiating it, and you've got like all of these asymmetries and whatever else is going on with your antenna, like all the compromises mean nothing once you're making a contact with someone and you have all of the data to show all of those contacts that you've made and all of those stations that were hearing you and is it an ideal antenna no is it good enough heck yeah look at all of those mm -hmm. data points that you had right and and i think that is a lesson that a lot of hams would do well to to learn and remember when putting things up can i throw a wet noodle into a tree and, and be happy with it well, you made some contacts, then yes, good enough, mm -hmm. right? Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. Uh, if I had the space for a full-size dipole or a tower with a four-element Yagi, I would do so in a heartbeat. Yep. I, I don't have that luxury. A lot of other folks don't have that luxury. So if it's really a, you know, a comparison not so much between this and a dipole or this and a Yagi, but rather between this and, and not nothing. getting on HF, which yeah. is what I had before, um, you know, this is uh, head and shoulders far and away better. Exactly. Um, 
and uh, you know I've got uh, got the contacts to show for it, and and not just FT8 either. I mean, these the, for this test was FT8, but I've made contacts uh, CW, SSB, yeah. you know, to to other continents, and the, the first time you get someone coming back to you from Germany or it's like rush, Chile, man. yeah, it's it's incredible. Such a rush. You know, so. Yeah, that's great. All right, we got another question here from Wayne VA three NCA. Or I'm sorry, Wade uh, VA three NCA. Do you know how directivity can be estimated based on the fence line geometry and feed point termination? Yeah. So in general, this design would uh, favor a slight directivity in the direction of the resistor. So um, standing at the ballon, looking towards the resistor, it's going to slightly favor that direction. Uh, with the backyard design in particular, uh, that is slightly reduced because you do get the vertical polarization from that uh, part going up the mast, and um, that would tend to be omnidirectional as uh, as verticals are. Um, you would probably get a little bit of a funky... Um, you also guess, got like that fold back that. because it goes three quarters of the way around your yard. Right, yeah. Right. So like is the direction you're talking about like... If the balance here, the resistor is here, and you got wire going, you know, up the three sides of the yard, you say in the direction of the resistor, as in this direction. Um. So, yeah. If you had it, if you had it like this, and and the balance is here, and it it runs kind of all around there, it would still be uh, I'm mirrored here. Yeah. Still is going slightly this way. Okay. Um. I think in part because I I've, I've got a slightly sloped downhill backyard. Oh, as well. that helps. So that helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of pushing it that way. The sloper portion of it as well aims it, you know, in, in that direction. Yeah. So um, your mileage would vary depending on the exact layout of your backyard and, um, you know, whether you had two vertical masts or the one and that type yeah. of thing. But but for me, and I think if the design of the uh, antenna was put up, not with the weird lobes like that, that, that I have it, um, it would tend to favor towards the, uh, the resistor. I know traveling wave antennas, like a beverage, uh, if it's in, if it's in a line, mm -hmm. then signals coming in from the resistor toward the feed point is definitely the, um, the preferred direction. Um, I, I don't know about this particular design because this is not a beverage. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot more, um, variables in this design. Um, mm. My suspicion is that it would just end up being basically omni, uh, you know, because it, you've got so many different elements pointing in different directions that it, the signal's going to get in. And if you really need to yeah. know, you can model it, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah with the attic version, um, one of the folks who watched the presentation that I gave last year did model it out and found that for the most part, uh, 20 meters was um, like three directions of similar strength and uh, you know, slightly weaker towards the other direction, 40 meters and up, it became more or less a, uh, you know, spherical, like pushing it up. Yeah. Um, and uh, you started getting some of the lobes on, uh, you know, 15 to, to six. So this would be probably similar, but all right, yeah. we got uh, time for one more question here. So this is a good one. William, KJ6PN asks, how do you attach the wire to the long stretches of fence? Um, so actually what I did is just um, ran it. So there, there was kind of the, the vertical parts, the poles between the slats of the fence. Every other one of those, I would just do it this way around it, and the next one that way around it. Um, so if you wanted, I, and, uh, what I did for the attic one was bought, um, just from the hardware store, electric fence standoffs. You know, if you were doing it as a more permanent install for your fences outside, you get a bag of those 30 of them for five bucks yeah. and, uh, just screw them in on the inside. Probably if you're wanting to hide it and, uh, just uh, put it through that and uh, work just fine. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour, so we uh, we have to wrap this up. There were Jiminy Crickets, a whole lot more questions that I hadn't seen because I hadn't scrolled down. My goodness. All right. So um, where can viewers find you if they have more questions that weren't answered because we ran out of time in the Q&A here? Where can people find you? 
Yeah, if you send me an email to kd3cr at arrl.net, that'll come through to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, folks have. Um, and if you um, download my slides again, back on the QSO today, hamexpo.com, click on presentations and download the slides. My uh, email address is on the last slide in there as well. So don't have to worry about you know writing it down or anything. Oh, and you've got it right there. Perfect. Did I get it right? Uh, I was going to ask you, kd3cr at awrl.net. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Corey. This was fantastic. Um, I always love it when I go to moderate a presentation and I learn a whole bunch of stuff. That's fantastic. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate you moderating and uh, all of the folks who are here watching us. So, yes, thank wonderful. you. Thank you, viewers, for coming. And uh, we'll uh, break for here. Have a great rest of the QSO, uh, the QSO Today Ham Expo, and we'll catch you later. 73s. All right. Thanks so much. 73.